ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the press conference of Nicholas Winning Reference, Too Old to Die Young, an Amazon series which premiered yesterday at the Cannes Film Festival and took us to north of Hollywood and west of hell. Today, live from south of film heaven, they're here to tell us more about it. To your far right, a man who's worked in Bronson, Valhalla Rising, Drive, Only God Forgives, and The Neon Demon, obviously a longtime friend of partner, but certainly a brilliant editor, Matthew Newman. Thank you. <laughs> Sitting next to him, one of today's undisputed screen talents, since his Sundance Dramatic Special Jury Award for his performance in The Spectacular Now, he showed true star power as a jazzy drummer in Whiplash, a boxing champ in Bleed for This, or an elite firefighter in Only the Brave. Ladies and gentlemen, Miles Teller. He is a unique voice in today's cinema, and this festival has always celebrated his vision from Drive, Best Director Award, to Only God Forgives and The Neon Demon. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Winding Refn, who we are so happy to welcome in Cannes. And my first question will go to you. I mean, Ed Baker, who also co-created uh, Too Old to Die Young, said that this was really quintessentially you. How did this intriguing, would you agree first, and how did this intriguing title come to your mind? And what did this giant canvas of 16 hours allow you to better explore or explore differently? Uh, well, it all started in a car in LA. <laughs> um, I, I can't drive a car and um, we were there uh, preparing the Neon Demon, and um, at that time was when Netflix was really starting to create original content with a lot of success. So the word around Hollywood was always like, you got to get into TV, just you got to get into TV now, you know. And I don't, I don't really watch television very much, so, but it was like, you just got to get that show and get things going. So, like anything, I was curious about this new canvas that with Netflix's idea of just unloading everything at once was very intriguing to me because it was a bit like accepting a whole new way of us communicating entertainment and especially how my kids were using entertainment. So... While we were preparing um, the neon, I was like one day thinking, maybe I should do something about death and religion. And I came up with a title in a car called Too Old to Die Young. And I thought, that's a, like, that's a great riddle. So I called Ed Brubaker, who's a very good friend of mine, and he came over and I said, listen, I have this idea, this concept, but... I want to make it really, really long, and I, I want you to co-create it with me. And Ed was, of course, intrigued enough, and for the people who don't know who Ed Brubaker is, he's probably one of the greatest graphic novel writers living today. And um, so us joining forces would be a great yin-yang. And then we just started creating it while I was making my film. And when my film then premiered the following year, uh, we were actually done with, uh, with the concept and some of the scripts. And uh, Amazon just came to me, who had been distributing my film in the US, saying whatever I wanted to do next, they would do. And I said, well, I have this idea to do a TV show. And um, and they were like, okay, great, yeah, send it over. And usually that means you don't hear anything. But I did send it over, and two weeks later, they were like, we'll do it. And then we were off to the races. Question here, please. From, 
Question from Brazil, TV Globo to Nicholas. Uh, your work is full of samurais, char uh, character warriors that follow their own path, their own code of honor. I would like to understand what would be the Bushido, the code of honor of the character of Teller in this film. Uh, well, I mean, the Martin character, like everything else, in what I find intriguing is always not knowing, you know, that the idea of curiosity is more interesting than the actual answer. And that's a fine line to walk, and to, to make that successful, you would need an actor in the kind of abilities of Miles Teller to, to, to create the enigma that essentially moves the show along, and um, as Shakespeare said, contradiction is the greatest drama of all. So I threw as many contradictions into Martin's character as I possibly could, and then adding a few great pauses here and there, we knew we were going to get something great. Question, ici, with you. Hi, Cindy Merrim, Diggin Magazine from the USA. Um, first off, I have a question for Nicholas Winding Refn. Um, how do you use your stylistic elements such as the neon or fluorescent lighting and low light as well as um, long takes on a character's face with little or no emotion to, to um, attain a desired mood effect? And for Miles Teller, um, what attracted you to this role of a tender-hearted killer and to work with Nicholas? Well, um, I guess in a way I, I grew up with, uh, my mom's a still photographer, so I've always been very interested in just the image itself. And I'd always, you know, I, I didn't really discover cinema, I discovered television when I was nine years old when I came to New York from Copenhagen. And the idea that I could control the images with the click of a button and can control the emotions and the contradictions that would be in clicking. And to me, the still image, the, 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 the image of a photo, you know, in a way is the most powerful element in all communication. And silence, you know, is, is, the, is the window of the soul in a way, because silence is revealing. You know, we live in a world where we're always thrown shiny objects left, right, and center for us to divert attention to. So silence and stillness is something that we, we almost fear. But in a way, that is the purity of the soul. If you, when you have children, you, especially when they're young, you always spend a lot of time engaging them in stillness and, 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 and dedication and, and silence. You know, we're just sitting, I have always played a lot with Legos with my kids and, or draw and that kind of intimacy that you can suddenly tap into can even become uncomfortable creatively, which to me is very, very interesting. Miles, what about your take and how <clears throat> you embrace this character and worked with Nicholas? Yeah, um, well, when I signed on to the project, I had only read the first episode. My agent sent me the first episode, so I didn't really know. Um, I mean, obviously, I really in enjoyed it, but I had no idea the journey and the odyssey of the, of the character of Martin. I think once you guys see the first episode, you'll see it. It's it. It hints at uh, this this kind of life that he's this double life he's about to to live, but it doesn't. I I had a, I had no idea. So for me, really, it was just working with Nick. I'm such a fan of Nick's work. Um, I also knew that Nick told me that we were going to shoot it in chronological order, and it was you know a certain amount of episodes. Uh, it ended up being about seven months for me that was really uh, intriguing to to have a character for that long um but yeah i didn't i didn't really need too much i i learned so much um on this project as i knew i would um being directed by nick i felt like i just learned um a lot about the the craft um i added a lot of things to my i think to my repertoire and it's it's very rare to to learn 
Um, I mean, you can learn about filmmaking, certain directors. I certainly learned that from Nick. But just as an actor, uh, I felt like I really grew from the experience. And, and that's, that's what I kind of chase. I chase the, the experience because that's the only thing that, that you can control. Question? Hi. This is Tavis Serra from Ara Newspaper from Barcelona. Uh, if I'm not correct, we've seen the chapters four and five from the series, or so we were told. Uh, I want to know why and if, if this has something uh, to do with the fact that we live in an era so obsessed with the spoilers, with not knowing anything in advance, and if, I don't know, if this, this is some kind of message to, to you, from you to this kind of obsession we're living in. Well, it's not the Mueller report, so. <laughs> um, what I do every morning when I wake up is when I make lunch for the kids. Um, usually I do it because my wife uh, runs, she's an exercise junkie. And um, I, I go on YouTube and I just click around, you know, and I immerse in things, usually a lot of political things, but also sometimes entertainment. And I look a lot of how my 15-year-old daughter uses entertainment and how they are just so advanced in how they communicate it and how they interact with it. So I thought, well, now that we've been invited to the greatest place to show creativity in terms of film, and this is a movie, it's a 13-hour movie. It's streaming, it's not TV. TV is like reality shows and some news channels. This is the future which is streaming. And um, the, the idea of saying, well, I rather want to introduce you to the heart of the show than to give you an introduction to a character. I wanted to, to entertain you like a showmanship. And I wanted you to ask me that question. And I was going to say, because you asked me. Yeah. Hello, a question for Nicholas, Jamie from the UK. Um, these two episodes have quite a bleak worldview, you could say. I mean, Miles, your character, it seems like there's a beating heart in there, but we see more as it goes on. But in terms of, you know, at the start of this episode, it talks about a slow crawl back to the dark ages and a kind of psychotic society. I just wondered what your own viewpoint is on the world at the moment and if that really does reflect it, that we're in very bad times. Well, what, what happened was, um, you know, when, 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 you, when you create, you have an intention to an idea of what it is. But then something very strange happened in the writing process, especially when we went to LA. You know, I live in Copenhagen, and when we moved to LA to start preparing the show, and we're still writing it, uh, the election was going on. And I was very affected in a way as a foreigner coming from Copenhagen, which is probably the most, most safest liberal town in the entire galaxy. Uh, I was like an alien, strange in a strange land for the first time in the US. And I was very affected by everything that was going on. And I just started almost bleeding into that, literally becoming, it was like channeling through of how I was experiencing the evolution of America. And then we shot the show when the election was over. And every day, because I shot in chronologically order, so we would be shooting during the day. And at night, I would go to the writer's room, and I would continue to write with Ed and Hallie Gross, which was another writer I brought on. And it was mostly just about reacting to the environment of what was happening in the world, even in the UK and so forth. And you suddenly get a sense that there is this kind of emerging apocalypse on its way and everything that is being projected and, and how, how the, 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 the idea of human behavior is suddenly being uh, exposed in ways that we thought we had kind of gone past. And all those things are very important to show teenagers. You know, they are the future. 
And they're also the hope. So the whole idea was to create a show where women were the hope and all the men were demolished. I mean, Ma Matthew, I see that, you know, I saw you nodding, and uh, Nicholas just mentioned how, in a way, organic the process was, like filming during the day, rewriting or writing at night. So I'm imagining that the editing was also a new collaboration, maybe, with Nicholas on that. How did you work? How was the organic process of editing on this particular film? Oh, this, the problem with this one was just volume because we had, he was shooting so much and there was, yeah. the show was so big. Um, but we talk every day mm -hmm. and I always have, and it's always been the same. That some directors don't come into the editing when they're shooting. They're so focused on all the problems on the set. And, but Nick is incredible because he, he's shooting and then he's writing and then he calls me for an hour. I don't know how he does it. I mean, everyone that works with him, I was like, how, how many hours are there in the day? Because he's, he will do a little often so we were always on the same page, and I watched him changing it and developing it every day. But it was an 18 month, was it that long, 18 months? It was very long, and it, and, um, it was really seat of the pants because he would change it all the time. And so, and this big machine behind him had to constantly just like follow, the boat had to follow where he was going. So you do it, it's all on, on, on faith, but um, I would agree with the apocalyptic <laughs> question because that's very well I didn't expect that because it started out much pulpier I mean from the first episode it was very very um pulp noir and that's still very much in the DNA of the show but then I think what Nick absorbed as he was out there writing it with his team Ed and Hallie that was very unexpected and I think that added to a whole other dimension to the to the to the show that none of us expected and and at the end of it when we finally had it all lined up and we spent all our weeks putting it all together and we could suddenly see this huge thing. We watched, I don't know, was it 12 hours, something like that? I mean, it's like, boom. it was very, very unexpected how, how that element had become. Um, Essential almost. Yeah, and, 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 and it grew out of the making of it. It, it wasn't something that had been pre-planned. Okay, we're gonna do apocalypse. It just, I think everyone kind of fed into it as it, as it went. It felt right. It does. When we saw the two episodes, it definitely felt right. <laughs> I really all want to like discover the whole scope of it. Question here, please. Hi, David Sanderson from The Times. Nicholas, you've just said that uh, the future is streaming. So what are the implications of this for cinema chains, for the big studios, and indeed for this festival? Well, I mean, I think that the studio is already, you know, getting ready for ultimate streaming. I mean, that's, I think, common knowledge. But what we have to remember is not nor this or that. It's just an alternate universe. But the difference between streaming and the more traditional theatrical is that streaming is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an energy flow around us that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we can tap into it through our social abilities and we can then consume how and when and what and that is a whole new way of ideology of how we coexist. And so to me, I, I was more like, what would, you know, my wife's biological father is Fritz Lang. And I thought, what would my father-in-law do today? And he would probably go into streaming because the, the opportunity of being endless, you know, when I make a movie, I have restrictions automatically going into it, which can be healthy creatively, but at the same time, it, there is a form of prediction within it. But when streaming, it was just like an ocean of possibilities and the idea that I could make something that didn't have, that had no control was so interesting that we would just, every day, just come to work and just paint, literally to, I just ran out of money. <laughs> but by then, we had shot for 10 months, you know? And um, so to me, it's more like a coexistence. You know, there will always be cinemas, and there should be cinemas, because it's part of our experience. 
And I think that yesterday at Cannes, which is a you know a place that's very um, emotional for me in a way to be, because it represents the whole idea of creativity being celebrated. You know, having this show here suddenly becomes the year zero now. You know, now Cannes has changed. It has mutated into the future. And with that comes an endless amount of possibilities. Marcelo, you were saying earlier that this film and working with Nicholas has changed you a lot in terms of your acting, in terms of your view of what a film could be or should be. Could you tell us more about, I mean, one of the things that I felt very strongly when I watched you know, these two episodes was that you were constantly on a, an identity quest and your silences and your pauses to me reflect that very powerfully. I mean, one of the, the, the question is there, you know, one of the characters says, if I'm, you say, if I'm not a cop, then what am I? And I would like you to tell us really how you view your character and how you embraced him from within. What did you tap into to become Martin? Well, the yeah, the show or the the, the film uh, yeah. was evolving. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is a film. Was, we said it yeah, absolutely. Was uh, was evolving constantly. Um, I think I don't really want to say too too much uh, about Martin, only because I think that um, even when I'm watching that character, I feel like he he keeps me at arm's length, and I and I played him, and I don't know if I ever fully kind of understand him by the end of it um but yeah it was just a really I mean because Nick when you're working with him you do a lot of you know you do a lot of takes um there was a uh, one day where it was I think a like a 12 minute um shot close up of me just looking at a man digging a ditch and uh we saw that scene. Yeah, you did not see the whole. The, the, you saw a, um, a greatest hits version of it. It was uh, it was it was long, and Nick is playing music at times. And yeah, you kind of get into this trance state. Um, I don't know. It was really such a unique experience that I will, you know, I can't compare it to to anything else. But yeah, it was a. It was really a, a a beautiful experience. What kind of music were you playing? We certainly heard Mandy. I mean, on the stairs last night, in the car. Very funny moment, actually. I mean, but very far stretch from the mood of the film. Well, I'm a very happy person, so yes, I, you I are. like I like happy music and <laughs> yes, <laughs> rock ballads and pop music, and I mean, what better way to go than Mandy, especially when you're in America, you know? I mean, <laughs> so Mandy kind of became a theme that we would use a lot. Um, we did a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of movement of the camera and. I would find music that had the rhythm that the camera needed to work with then when they were moving it and so forth. So, you know, music is, is, is a tool to express emotions. You know, it's like dance or poetry, whatever. Music is, is an opportunity to enlighten, you know, and, and move forward. You always say that in each of your films, there is, a, there is a heart. There's a scene that in particular summarize at the heart of the movie. Mm. We can't disclose, obviously, the scope of it all, but were they seen that you and Ed, I mean, particularly worked on to create the heart of this movie, which we haven't seen yet, obviously. Could you tell us about this, the heart of this movie to you? It's in episode nine and I can't say anything. Oh no, <laughs> episode nine. Is that even true? Episode nine, we should be looking there? I would never lie to you. Good, good. In, in fact, <laughs> Matthew... Not fake news. <laughs> good, we're counting on it. And in fact, Matthew, so when you were edit in the editing room, did you already have the music uh, for you to focus on and to help you, as Nicholas would say, help you move organically the process? Well, Cliff was writing from the beginning. From the beginning, from he the was beginning. on. So yeah. he, he worked alongside us for a year. Cliff was here... On the last film, he should be here today. He's amazing. Yeah. He wrote so much music. 
So we showed him the first episode, I think within a month of it having been photographed. And he just made an offer, this, 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 or this, and it was that. And then he just kept going and he kept reinventing himself each episode because each episode was so distinct in a way. And he would, yeah, he, we sent it him naked and he sent back the score. And he, we almost never revised it. it. He was right out of the bag. He's very happy with it. He, he really thought like, oh, wow, really, really great. But it was amazing. He wrote so much music for us and he worked, I think, the whole year of production right up until we mixed it. One of the things that I found very intriguing re reading about the process of the movie was that you went to do two readings with Alejandro Jodorowsky, who I know is a big influence on you. And I could not help obviously thinking of the card reader character in your film. I mean, is that an homage? Is she your, your Jodorowsky, so to speak? Because how intriguing to start a movie with tarot games. Well, it's the, the, the tradition is that uh, whenever I start anything, I go to Paris and, and, I, and I see Alejandro and um, we talk a little bit and then he tells me what's wrong and then I <laughs> tell him what I'm working on and then we have a reading and with this, he was like, yes, yes. <laughs> Because I was talking about wanting to move into, you know, the, the, the smaller screen. He calls it television, I call it streaming. But he's like, television, fantastic, fantastic. This is where the audience goes. I can't even do his accent very well. But um, so we had a very um, interesting tarot reading on the show as I was telling him about it. He said, just make sure they kill bad people. They have to kill bad people. And um, then we, I came back right like s four months before we started shooting and we had another tarot reading and he said that I needed a female writer. Uh -huh. And he said, you have to have a mother and a father. And I said, got it. And I'd worked with, you know, two wonderful writers on my last film. So um, I went back to LA and uh, um, Heli Gross, who was a, a young um, screenwriter out of the US, uh, came in and became the, the missing link of the team. And then it was just the three of us in a room. And I don't think I've ever laughed so much for so many months. So it was, um, it was you know, when in doubt, go to Alejandro and listen. Wow. Well, obviously, we will soon discover the whole scope of it this summer, but what I wanted to know is also, by the end of it all, you are very much, I mean, a movie buff, a movie lover, a cinephile, and I wanted to end this press conference with something that I found extraordinary that you are doing, did and are doing, it's your own streaming platform called By NYR. And I would like you to tell us a little bit about this because I wish that everybody would absolutely go on this streaming site and consult really the movies that you are highlighting. Could you tell us about it? Because all of us are obviously are in love with the movies. Uh, well, uh, some years ago, I had this idea to create my own kind of platform as an experiment online with this, you know, tapping into this flow of energy. And um, I came up with this concept that I wanted to do a foundation that was a curation of culture, but it had to be culture for everyone because culture is for everyone. And that the manifestation was that it was going to be free. And um, I then bought a film library and brought other people into it. So now we're a bigger team around the world. And um, the idea of buynwr.com now, which as you saw at the presentation, is it will now become the producing arm of my own material from now on, as well as continuing to grow as a culture streaming site of various interesting endeavors. And you can all just lock on and go to town. Well, you got this, the idea for too old to die young on a film set. 
did you have any new idea for your next project on that set during all these months that we can... I, my first reaction when I was done with the show is that I'm going to do a movie next. <laughs> well, we're already looking forward to the 16-hour movie. Thank you very much for your you. presence. Thank Nicholas you. Winning Refn, Miles Teller, and Matthew Newman. Thank you very much. <laughs>